Thank you, Heather. Can you hear me okay? Great. Well, what a wonderful opportunity for me to come back in this building. I haven't been here since the, the 90s when it was a restaurant, so I'm, I'm glad to see it's gone to great use. Uh, great introduction by Heather. Thank you very much. I won't go back into any other details. But this is a little bit unique. Here I'm talking to the, uh, you know, in maritime sense about our watersheds. And so the questions you may have may be centered more uh, appropriate with the interface of the watersheds as they roll out of the county and head to the ocean and then become in the maritime environment. Uh, and I'm going to go through uh, a, a series of slides here that uh, I'm glad to see you ate and, and are drinking now because uh, you know, I am a professional engineer and by education and you know a math geek. So it, there are some technical aspects that uh, may uh, Intrigue some and, and bore others, but uh, cut me off. Or head back to the bar and, uh, and uh, you know, be happy. <clears throat> I'm going to talk. Uh, I'm going to orient orient you to the watersheds that uh, are responsible to me uh, in Ventura County. Uh, the prior name for this was the Flood Control District, and in the late uh, around the turn of the century. The, uh, the literacy level of the, of the population uh, became more green and environmentally conscious, hence uh, watershed became, uh, the watershed protection became a dominant feature that the Board of Supervisors recognized and wanted to pursue and get away from the, perhaps the narrow view of what a flood control district uh, would, would mean to you all. So I'll go through a little orientation. Then I'm going to uh, branch off of that and talk uh, more current topics uh, for a response to the Thomas Fire, what it meant a little bit uh, with respect to the watersheds, again, primarily up in uh, the Ventura River watershed, but has application to your near uh, Santa Clara River watershed. And then uh, I'm going to break off of that and then talk to a very technical project that we're doing here locally on the Santa Clara River which is improving the levee, the levee system downstream of Highway 101. And that project is, is ongoing, and we have a second phase in the future that will, will improve the levee north of uh, Highway 101. But I'm going to talk to the south. Uh, and then we'll wrap that up. i got a couple videos embedded in here that uh, I'll break, and we'll play uh, some of that. And then we'll be open to some questions. So here's the, how the watersheds are broken up in the county. And they're based on the river system. Uh, Santa Clara River is very broad. And as you see, it reaches around and actually goes around Ojai on the backside and ends up in Santa Barbara County because of the Sespe, the Sespe uh, watershed that contributes to the Santa Clara River. And the Ventura River is pretty well contained and uh, has the headwaters above the uh, Matilla Dam in the North Fork of Matilla Creek and the Matilla Canyon, which also uh, ends up in Santa Barbara County. Cayagas, that's uh, the Cayagas uh, system is coming out of uh, Royal Simi uh, and the Cayagas Creek, which rolls out of uh, Thousand Oaks and combine and, and head to the ocean right uh, at Point Magoo, the Point Magoo Lagoon, Lagoon. That's where that watershed uh, interfaces with uh, the ocean. A, a couple of oddball ones we call Zone 4. There's the Ku Kuyama watershed. And that river, the Kuyama River, tracks to the northwest uh, and actually crosses uh, in, through Santa Barbara County on the north end and then San Luis Obispo County. So it's a, it's a unique uh, basin up there, uh, but the headwaters are in Ventura County. And the Malibu Creek area that's uh, primarily uh, above Thousand Oaks and heading towards uh, the Agora Hills, which is outside of the county, but there's unincorporated area and drainage that flows out of that into Los Angeles County and ends up in Malibu, that, those particular watershed drainages. In Ventura County, you're going to see these particular signs when you break into different watersheds. And in this particular case, this is on Highway 150 at Summit, which is in Upper Ojai. And uh, as you, in this case, you leave, you have just left the Santa Clara 
river watershed and you're entering the Ventura watershed. But you'll see these signs everywhere, and primarily when you're going over hills. If you go over Highway 23, you'll see a series of these as you go from Santa Clara into Cayagas. Anyone seen these signs? Yes. <clears throat> Flood control components. I'm going to highlight a couple of these very quickly just to whet your appetite. Flood control facilities, so those are drainages, they're levees, they're their concrete structures, their natural channels, etc. And we have uh, within that is the flood warning system that I'll talk to in more detail, but that's an electronic real time monitoring, monitoring system where we're evaluating rainfall real time uh, every uh, two minutes. We're getting rainfall data and then we're, we're measuring that effect on the watersheds with respect to the, the rivers and the uh, river gauging systems that we have throughout the county. I'll talk in more detail with that. But rivers and creeks, those are natural and they're primarily, uh, I put it here for jurisdiction purposes. Jurisdiction meaning permits. So <clears throat> the Watershed Protection District is in charge of monitoring anyone who wants to do anything to a, a particular channel. So if you want to if you want to cross it, if you want to build a bridge over it, uh, put a pipe under it, <clears throat> If you want to drain into it, you have to come to the county and the Watershed Protection District to get a permit to deal with the, the bed and banks, is what we call it, dealing with these uh, creeks. Groundwater basins, so that, that was, those are in the watershed. It's uh, a, kind of a high topic right now because in 2014, the state passed the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, which forces all the critical or high priority and medium priority basins to come into some management compliance. And so uh, those agencies are now getting underway with some deliberate action as their, their plans on how they're going to manage over the next 20 years are due for the critically overdrafted basins by 2020. Stormwater quality and stormwater facilities, this, this is a, a mixture of activity combined with uh, recharge of uh, base of, of water, trying to get more storm water into our basins, and then it's the quality of our basins. Can you see that? Yes. Environmental ecosystem. So that brings uh, the greening aspects and and gets to the whole the watershed concept up into the headwaters all the way down in in through the estuaries into the oceans. Flood control, I want to highlight just one aspect. Here's an example of flood control up at Royal Seamy and Moore Park. This was some damage done when it rained two years ago. We didn't get any rain this past year, but two years ago we actually had some measurable rain and we lost a, a stabilizer. It's called a stabilizer here and here. And a stabilizer controls the volume of flow and the speed of that flow. Uh, without those, is what happened here, you get start getting high flow and high velocity flow starts eating away at the sides, this erosion effect. And in this case, this is, a, this is in the city of Moore Park, this is a sewer line uh, that was in the ground, is now out of the ground. So it caused, uh, it caused us some immediate uh, action and uh, it caused the uh, sewer plant operator some immediate concern. And, we, and then this is the repair effort uh, that occurred about a month or so later to restore that aspect, this reach. This area is near Moore Park High School. Assets, uh, Matilha Dam, you're all familiar with that, been around since 1947. Uh, that's uh, Watershed Protection District's asset. It's, uh, it's our property and we're in charge and we're regulated by the state as the dam owner for this particular facility. And we have a lot of a, a, a series of projects that we want to complete to uh, set the conditions to remove the dam. And uh, I could talk to you at length about uh, all of those. Uh, but to highlight a couple things, uh, the Parks Bond has a component that was just passed in, in June, this past June, uh, which uh, allows for uh, uh, steelhead recovery habitat type projects, which will contribute to this particular project. But more importantly, this uh, November, there's uh, Proposition 3, I believe. Uh, we'll have an $80 million line item 
in that bond, which contributes to the removal of uh, the dam and the associated projects. So there's lots of uh, potential money that can come and come to bear to help out with uh, this particular asset. Touched on groundwater agencies, and uh, this highlights the Fox Canyon Groundwater Management Agency. It's actually it's one of the oldest groundwater management agencies in, in the state. It was uh, set forth in 1982, so it has some runtime. Uh, since 2014, when the law was passed, there are a series of other agencies that are just now getting under underway. So their their governance structure and the rigor behind their data is is really zero. They're infants. Uh, this particular agency, which uh, overlies uh, the Oxnard Plain here and the Las Posas uh, aquifers, uh, has been around for a long time. And this is just a pictorial representation of, uh, of uh, its boundary here on the Oxnard Plain. Environmental stewardship. So the aspect as uh, the watersheds come to the ocean, as well, I'll highlight this. So uh, beach erosion. If you talk, if, we, if I go back to Matilla Canyon and the dam, the the beach erosion effect uh, and the removal dam will allow sediments to come back and perhaps restore uh, eroding beach sands uh, up and down, really south of the Ventura River, uh, which have been uh, contained up above the dam. You know, there's eight. There's eight million cubic uh, yards of uh, material up up above the dam. So uh, there there are places down south towards Malibu who could use sand. And uh, once that <clears throat> that uh, river system gets restored back, it'll allow that natural that natural sediment flow to continue. And the soils here are wonderful. It's wonderful sand. There's a group in. Uh, it, near Malibu, who's trying to import sand because they're they're losing sand. It's called Broad Beach, and uh, they're trying to buy sand from Vancouver and uh, and get it down here and pump it onto the shore. Uh, but the color's off. Right? So it, doesn't, it doesn't look like your sand that's coming down. The... <laughs> I highlight th this is a, a unique project, and I want to just highlight the interface between public and private. So this, uh, this project is at the base at, of uh, Casitas Dam. <clears throat> it's called uh, Coyote Creek. It's on private lands. Uh, this particular low water crossing got flooded a couple years ago. And because it's on pri private lands, we are not allowed to go on there and, and do work without uh, buying easements, temporary or permanent, or buying fee. <clears throat> and we're not allowed to pay for any work. So, uh, via Supervisor Bennett, dealing with the neighbors there, they came up with a project that we would be the sponsor, we'd go after federal money, and the residents would pay uh, the Delta. So in this case, there was a, it's a, it was a 75%, 25% match. 75% federal money, 25% other people's money, in this case, private landowners, came to bear and financed this project and the Watershed Protection District oversaw the contracts and uh, level of effort to improve this channel and get the water to flow so uh, the slow water crossing would allow access. Part of, part of the, uh, the urgency was the, um, to get in this neighborhood, had to go through this area, so apparatus, uh, emergency response vehicles could not get through this um, this crossing, they'd have to go around and up and over the mountain to get to residents in that particular area. So I don't know. If, this is this is a this is on the north side of the river, uh, you know, right below the dam. Watershed professionals. So the, uh, just highlight a couple. Who 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 makes up the uh, watershed Prote protection district? Engineers and technicians. I'm an engineer, so that's why we're listed first. <laughs> But I think more importantly, the hydrologists, <laughs> hydrogeologists, and hydro hydrographic surveyors, those are the, the real you know, technical wizards behind uh, all the, the detail I'm going to show you here in the, going forward. Environmental planners, water resource planners, specialists, uh, a host of equipment operators and maintenance workers to help with uh, flood fighting and kind of routine maintenance, construction inspectors, grants, 
GIS, technicians, etc., and support staff. There's lots of, uh, I have about 134 people working for the, the district right now. <clears throat> mission, protect, this is my only mission slide, so don't go to sleep yet. <laughs> Protect life, property, community infrastructure from flood events, improve water resource management, enhance health and natural function of watersheds in Ventura County. So that, that sums it all up. And that's the greening piece. Uh, in 1947, they established the Flood Control District. It's just really the first part, which is obviously a critical part. Protect life and property, and that's the foundational component to uh, what we're about. Our vision, we champion an environmentally resilient and economically sustainable future for Ventura County watersheds through regional leadership and building community alliances benefiting current and future generations. So that piece gets to a, a much more broader component and there's a real push to be a regional leader. Uh, just for example, in this county, uh, there are about 100, 170 independent water purveyors throughout the county. And so they have a very narrow and perhaps uh, myopic approach to uh, what that is. And so there's, a, there's an aspect where the, uh, the county being involved in water and groundwater needs to help provide some, some leadership and, and perhaps broadening perspectives as, as it approaches uh, uh, regional water supply projects where individual companies cannot come to bear with uh, either preparing, planning, or executing that type of work. So we're going to transition, this is my transition slide. So in the safety world, I talk about this quite a bit, right? Are you, are you lucky or are you good? Are your programs good? Do you have good command and control? Uh, in this case, we're talking uh, kind of about our flood warning system, what it means, disaster preparedness, etc. We're going to transition into the Thomas Fire component okay. here. Yeah. Uh, after I talk floods, I forgot, I'm going to talk floods. So <clears throat> this is a... This is a kind of a histogram for rainwater at uh, Ventura City Hall. And it goes back to 1873 when rainfall was measured by the month. You didn't get daily, you didn't get month, you know, it was, it was a monthly summation. So I don't, it's, if you're looking at the month of December in 1873, you don't know if it rained on the 5th of December or the 25th, just the summation. <clears throat> But it's a lot of data. And then I've uh, highlighted, you know, when there were some flooding events. And I'm going to show you a short video of some highlights of floods. 39, 43, 69. 69 is a big flood year, yeah. right? But it's not a big rain year in total. So the intensity of rain, when it came, how much came in a given time period, really obviously caused uh, the problem in 1969. Because overall, it's not a very big year. 78, 95, 2005, big years. But what's missing, 41, big year of rain. I don't have it, I, I've been looking through the archives, don't find a lot of flooding issues. And then in 1998, really a historic total year of, of rain in Ventura, but not a lot of, uh, I haven't found a lot of detail. I found some localized aspects of rain damage, but not a, not a really big year um, for, for disasters, if you will. And then uh, my team said, oh, the next big one, right? It's, uh, we well, hope. Yeah, well, we need lots of rain over a, a long period of time, yes. It's like Seattle, anyone been to Seattle? Yes. I mean, it rains every day, but you, it's like a tenth of inch of rain every day builds up to like 30, 40, 40 inches. <coughs> so this will be a short video with some really odd music. Uh, and, and at the bottom, you're going to see little monikers of when these are and where, where the particular flooding is located.
last one here, Camarillo Springs, 2014. But I don't know. 2005, I really get a kick out of that one because it says flooded, it's Casita Springs area, and it says again. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I hope that whet your appetite for disasters. So that's the flood disasters. But we had an unprecedented event, obviously, with the Thomas Fire that uh, really uh, kind of broke the bank, uh, changed our paradigm with how we deal with some of these disasters. <clears throat> And this is a burn severity map provided by the state. I don't know if, you, if you've seen some of this uh, information, but uh, red, this is Ojai, up above Ojai, here's Ojai. So in this range over to Montecito, Santa Barbara County, tremendous burn, 100% okay, burn. Uh, and the impact in comparison to Ventura, here's Ventura, Santa Paula, uh, this area, more rangeland, grassland, and not as much fuel, and not as much uh, dense trees, shrubs, etc. So the severity is less in, in this particular area between Santa Paula and uh, Ventura, and it burned very quickly. So it doesn't have the severity. And why that's important is uh, the hydrophobic component of a fire on the soil. It creates the gases after it burns on, on a hot, <coughs> at a hot temperature and completely creates this hydrophobic, so it's hydro, water, phobic against the soil has this layer that repels uh, rain, which gets to debris, higher higher risk for debris flow and just pure sheet runoff, right? So it contributes to a, what we call bulk flow. So in, in aspects, uh, it, it may double the flow that ends up in the channel or the creek because it, none of the rain is soaking in. So that, that was what we expected in this particular past year. The fire came, obviously, at the beginning of December. Thereafter, <clears throat> that we expected, obviously, a hydrophobic condition. We got a little bit of rain, uh, but we didn't get a lot of regrowth because we didn't get enough rain. And going into the next year, we're thinking we're going to have similar type issues, probably not as bad, but we're looking at a five to seven year horizon for the burn effect on uh, the watersheds and the restoration of that. I'm just going to touch on this briefly because uh, it's become quite a, quite an issue, and uh, this is kind of the command structure. When we have a tremendous event like this, you have the feds that come in, you have the federal government people, you have Cal uh, Fire, Cal OES, mm -hmm. Office of Emergency Service to come in and try to flow into both uh, Santa Barbara County's governance structure and Ventura County's governance structure. And these are, these are just, I was in the Navy for a long time, and these are, when you bring units together who haven't trained or practiced, these are always the issues, and they're all centered around communication. Different jargon, everyone has, everyone has acronyms that will kill you and no one can understand them. The, the decision making is done at different levels. And so uh, these are just, oh, you can look at this on your own leisure, but uh, just wanted to highlight the, that it's not always a smooth running show when you have to bolt on all these other agencies to get things done quickly. Public works within the, so that your county sheriff's office runs and maintains the, uh, through, through its Office of Emergency Services, runs an emergency operations center. It's uh, underneath the jail over at the uh, county center uh, familiar off of Victoria Avenue. So it sits in the basement down there. And it's coordinated with the cities. Uh, and it's, um, it's a smooth running machine. And I can talk to the, the value of that and the recognition that they've received kind of throughout the, the state and, and the nation with respect to how, how it runs and how efficiently. But from a public works and a watershed perspective, we have personnel embedded into that particular unit when, whenever an event comes up. Fire was one of them, uh, to provide logistics support, transportation, so public works has all the county roads that have to be maintained and, and operated, and then the watershed component, which, uh, and we provide flood warning system details in addition to flood fighting. So in addition to the first responders, I'm sending out all my teams out to our known hotspots, and we will work on uh, preparing for the actual flood fight. 
if we had a, a breach in a particular channel or a levee, or we know a culvert's going to overflow, we'll have transportation there, perhaps with us, and perhaps even the, uh, the fire district has uh, assets, heavy equipment assets that uh, uh, we can call a bear on at particular areas. Forecasting and modeling, uh, National Weather Service, we're kind of unique here in, in uh, Oxnard because you have a, a National Weather Service office here. Great coordination, they're part of uh, these coordination calls that go on with uh, the county and its operation, Emergency Operations Center. But the, uh, the Watershed Protection District pays uh, an extra forecasting, uh, a private forecasting company uh, to provide us these uh, quantitative precipitation forecasts, QPFs. And National Weather Service has this, but there's a local company called Fox Weather, which we subscribe to. And he provides uh, a lot more uh, precision and accuracy with regard to forecasting uh, in, in respect to the intensity of rain that may be falling and when it will come, which is really the critical nature and is, what, and is why uh, there was such a problem in Montecito. Montecito, for instance, had a little over half an inch of rain in five minutes. That's, that, and that's what happened in that particular watershed. And we run models. I'll show you some, some this is just the words. I'll show you what it actually turns out to be here. After these uh, emergency evacuation zones, so one last step before we get into my uh, flood warning system and the, and the gauging network. So um, back to the Thomas fire, the, the county EOC and the decision makers when it comes to evacuations, uh, it's controlled by the sheriff. The sheriff in this county calls the shots and it's in coordination with cities that don't contract with the county for fire or, or uh, uh, police services. And uh, they broke up the fire area into zones, 10 zones, <clears throat> to help facilitate uh, the precision of data that uh, the sheriff could receive and, and not have to call evacuation orders for the entire burn area. If you hear uh, the National Weather Service, if they put out an alert, it'll be for the whole Thomas burn fire, flash flood potential for the entire Thomas fire burn area. Well, that can, that, that's right. Are you going to evacuate uh, you know, 90,000 people? No. So they div they've uh, decided to divvy it up into 10 zones <clears throat> and uh, be a little more deliberate and uh, work on accuracy and precision within these uh, zones in, in before they go and, and call whether or not they're going to issue an evacuation notice. The, uh, and then this is a county website where those zones get kind of boiled down into a, a per zone page and on this page has the rain gauges that are particular in zone one. So this is, uh, zone one is up the coast from Ventura up to the border with Santa Barbara County. But the rain gauges that affect zone one and the watersheds are listed here. And they, uh, the flood warning system will populate this. So this is a public facing website. You'll be, you can look at each zone and, and see what's, what's occurring in, the, in 50 minute intervals. And the evacuation status will also be presented on this page. Down below this page has the details of uh, when the sheriff might and how he will call an evacuation for zone one. Um, and, th and these uh, zones have all been briefed to the zone residents. So we've had a series of uh, campaigns, if you will, over the winter to educate the local populations in, in these particular zones on, on, on what this means and how they will get information. Here's the flood warning system. This is another public facing website that you all can go to. This highlights, uh, in this particular slide highlights all the rain gauges that are in, in the county of this past January. So you can see in the Montecito area, and we got a little over half, one and a half inches of total rain in a 24-hour period, which doesn't trip any any thresholds for us. And so these are color coded based on thresholds of rain intensity and longevity. These red marks up here, this is in the Matilla Canyon, so they trip to 24-hour 
threshold, and there's a five, almost 5.4 inches, 4.6 in the Attila, Attila Canyon. And when we went back after this rain in the Attila Canyon, we saw huge mud flows. It was just like an avalanche type of uh, uh, situation. So there, there are four to six feet tall mud flows in and, in and throughout the Matilla Canyon. And that, that particular storm, as it came through, very narrow band of rain came over the, uh, the Channel Islands, made a beeline right here, and then kind of fizzled out and started to ebb. You can see how they kind of ebbed over this way. But it never made it, you know, kind of went right up to the Matilla Canyon and, and really stayed west of Highway 33. Never made it to Ojai. Ojai proper, one and a half. So Ojai really better, you know, got lucky here. <laughs> So this, for, this, is a, this is also a, a slide that's on our um, public facing website. And this is where I think all the money is. And uh, well, I, this may take a while to go through, so if you need to get a drink, this might be the one. <laughs> okay, so this is, a, this is our river gauging plot. And uh, I'm going to highlight a couple things. You can stop me if, if you need. At the top here, this is going to be rain actual rain that's, uh, that's falling, observed in the past. And then you get to this dotted line, and anything beyond that is going to be forecasted rain. And so all, that, all those uh, subscriptions we have and the data that's coming in all gets plotted here. So this is going to be a visual screen that's, uh, that can, can be produced for the sheriff and our folks to help advise and counsel the sheriff on what's occurring. So that's rain is going to be up there, and then uh, this is uh, this is what's happening in the river. So this particular site, Santa Clara River at Victoria. So just right up right up the road, we have a we have a stream gauge there, and we're measuring the stage. So what elevation it is? This is elevation, not not how high, not how deep the water is. This is actual elevation and as it's occurring. Uh, in real time until you get to this point. And anything beyond to the right is all forecasted. We have river forecast models. We're tied into the National River Forecast Model, et cetera. And we've run historical data. We've collected data as far back as we can that are, have been handwritten. And we've loaded it into our models over the years. And we do it every year after every rain season. We enter the data to, to help refine what the uh, prediction uh, could be if we get more rain, or what we'd expect for that river to do over time as it has stopped raining. And so here it stopped raining. It stopped raining right here, so the river was gaining uh, elevation. And uh, I forgot to mention, this side is the flow in cubic feet per second. So it's, it's matched, so at uh, 41 and a half feet, it's flowing at about 7,400 CFS at that marker up here at <clears throat> Victoria and uh, the river. So after it stops raining, you can see how fast it starts to ebb, right? The, 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 the flow and volume and the height really fall off quickly. And uh, the nature of your watersheds in this county are just that. You can go up Topa Topa, it's what, 6,000 feet up there in elevation. Matilla Canyon at 4,000 feet on the mountains behind it. And uh, it's 13 miles to the ocean. And so whatever's there has got to get out of there in quick fashion. So floods on the East Coast, you know, it's going to snow melt up in Iowa. And it, it, the rivers rise real slow, but they never stop rising. And, you know, it's just and there's nothing that you can do about it. Here, everything's moving very fast, so the life cycle of a particular event is fast. You may have a real high peak, but it will end fairly quickly after it rains. And then uh, with respect to floods, we've plotted all the record floods, and we have action levels for different types of flows based on history and the models. And then underneath the 
I won't show it to you, but there are uh, actions that are taken once we uh, hit, say, an action level. And it, uh, I don't have one for this particular point, but on the Ventura River, it, once we read, reach an action level, the first action level, which would be here, uh, we run over, we get with the city of Ventura, and we run over to the RV park on the north side of the river, right by the highway, and we say, get out. <laughs> so that's an action level. And so there, there's a whole series of action levels that are tied uh, to geography based on the flow and where it is on the river system. Really exciting stuff, right? <laughs> I mean, this is, this is the money slide right here. Uh, so we're going to slide away from that for a minute. <clears throat> Rain season, the fire came at a really unique time. Uh, we were done cleaning out things that we wanted to get done in preparation for a rain season that never came. So we had organic ca uh, capacity and contractor capacity ready to go to do extra work after the fire. That's really the only silver lining of, of a main disaster. We were ready and we got extra ready. And extra ready we did additional cleanouts, we cleared stuff, uh, we adjusted our flood, flood warning system and what that means is USGS gave us some burned area thresholds, and the key threshold for debris flow, uh, actionable debris flow, is a half, half inch of rain in an hour. And so once we, once we get into the forecasting and we get predictive intensities, uh, if that threshold comes, then all the sheriff wants to get together and we have some, a big seance with the other cities and we start, <laughs> we start talking about okay, how good is the forecasting? And we really get into this rigor about what it means because uh, at least in this county, you know, calling an evacuation order voluntarily mandatory is, is a big deal. And the sheriff wants to be, wants to be uh, precise and accurate to the best of uh, everyone's ability. And I highlight uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, uh, Santa Barbara County after Montecito had the Army Corps come in and they, they did all the de debris removal. Tremendous job. You know. um, upwards of $150 million. Right, that's a lot of money. But anyway, uh, we didn't have a problem in Ventura County because it didn't rain. Uh, but we worked out a deal with the Army Corps who was just up the road. They have an emergency management office in, in Los Angeles. And we uh, set up real estate agreements under this authority, PL 8499, public law, that uh, brought heavy equipment in place and pre-staged in case we had a problem here in this county along the 126 corridor, so the Santa Clara River. We wanted to have equipment here in case something happened, you couldn't get equipment from uh, you know, Central Valley over five or some other issues. So we, um, we negotiated this uh, and put this in place, and they brought equipment here and had it pre-staged. Uh, the real concern for us was uh, Santa Paula Creek, and whether or not uh, we were going to have a problem as it interfaces with uh, the Santa Clara River uh, in Santa Paula. I'm going to highlight just a couple projects that, that we did that were unique. This was a Hesco Barrier Diversion. This is in uh, Ojai Valley on the east end. Uh, just east of Seoul Park. And this is really just an earth diversion. Uh, Hesco barriers were popular in uh, the Iraq and the Afghanistan war to build uh, uh, kind of hasty barrier systems. In this case, we're using it for flood diversion so it doesn't impact a particular neighborhood as flood plume. Uh, this particular area is, is a alluvial fan, which means the water can kind of meander or go anywhere. We want to be able to control it and direct it and get it into the, keep it in the channel if it were to break out. So here's an experiment. This is a thousand feet long on the east side of, uh, or south side of 150 on the east end of Ojai. We did a number of these projects. Uh, these are bollard projects that we put in. These are six feet tall, uh, three foot on center bollards. In canyons where we, we were expecting large rock flow, large debris flow, uh, and primarily this one's located in Fox Canyon, which is above Ojai, up of, uh, out of, uh, kind of west of Foothill. I think it's Foothill. Uh, Arbolada, up, up in that area. 
But here, you can see how steep this terrain is up here. Whatever's coming down, this was taken in uh, early April. So things were green, uh, but when we were working down in this area, we, we watched the creek walk back. It was drying out, and it was retreating back up the canyon at, uh, you know, like feet a day. It was just, you could just walk, come out one day, and just, it was, you know, draining. But you can see with the steepness, whatever is going to come loose is going to come down fast and hard. So we have a series of these in, in various locations. This is the Arundel Basin in up above Ventura, the city of Ventura. This is interesting because here we had an app application of it's clean, it looks nice. Right? Uh, but here we have, we, uh, we tried out some new products to stabilize uh, the soil from erosion. And a lot of people will say, well, it's hydro mulch. It's a hydro mulch component, it has some emulsifiers in it, so it will stick to the soil. Uh, but we're not going to hydro seed. This is just uh, the mulch component. Uh, the state conservation, national conservation um, uh, assistance that we have uh, requested with regard to hydro seeding indicate that hey, anything above 10% slope and the seeds are not going to—they're not going to work. They're going to wash away. And so uh, we're working on—we're experimenting with just the mulch to keep the soil in place. Uh, so now, uh, out of the disaster mode, we're going to head into a, a particular project that we're working on just up the road here, uh, near the uh, uh, river, is it River Park golf course, and uh, coming south of uh, downstream of Highway 101 on the Santa Clara River. So you may ask, uh, water percent protection in NFL football, is it related? <laughs> yeah, well, last summer it was related. Because uh, we needed to get this level of effort done in a particular area so uh, the Cowboys could come and, and train. And uh, uh, this was a big deal for the city of Oxnard and, and us. We didn't want to be in the way. Uh, and we weren't. So just to orient you to this particular project, here's Highway 101. This is the Santa Clara River. Ocean. And here's the, the golf course, and here's the series of homes. And this blue area is uh, what used to be called is a 100-year flood or 100-year protection inundation area. Uh, now we, it's been refined, and it's the same thing, but in, in kind of the parlance of flood control, it's called the 1% chance event, right? Mm -hmm. Same thing. 100-year flood sounds good because... I had all those old pictures of floods, and they were 100-year floods, but they're floods. 1% chance of a rain event that's going to inundate some properties. It doesn't have the same ring, ring to it. But anyway, we are improving uh, the levee system uh, from uh, right about here. I'll show you a different slide, but here down to, this is Victoria. Down here. So uh, we've improved this section, and the Cowboys trained... You know, obviously, on this side. This is a little tighter picture of, of what I'm talking about. Here's Victoria. Here's the river. And here's Highway 101. And this is River Ridge. Or, no, River... Park. River Park. This is River Ridge. River Park. So we are improving reaches two, three, and four. <clears throat> this is a, the wagon wheel development, if you're familiar with this, right? And so the, the developer is working on this little section. Uh, and the whole project is to get the levy certified from a federal standpoint, which will allow the uh, national flood insurance requirements uh, be removed, right? So that, that's... Yeah. So, so, sorry to interrupt. The wagon wheel area is a hot mess. Is you talking about this thing? What is the plan for those parcels in there? I mean, specifically. Well, it's being developed now, and for they were. What use? I'm not sure what. Well, I see apartments or condos going in there now. Is it? Right, and I've seen the um, 
They brought in a bunch of dirt to raise the elevation of those particular properties, the base elevation. So I don't have the detail of what's actually in there. But they are working the flood protection component such that it will comply and, and be certifiable from a FEMA perspective. So canals or is it being paved? It'll be a, uh, probably a, a flood wall of some, side, uh, some sort. And uh, I'll show you what, what we've been doing. So <coughs> downstream, we've been placing rock and improving the levee system uh, with some toe down. Uh, this was the cowboy thing. This uh, is a lease turn, and uh, he uh, got in the way of this project. <coughs> was she? He and she, <laughs> because they had a, they had a, they had some, they had some little guys, and uh, the way the environmental pro protocols are set up is you can't move it, you can't move it, and you have to set up an exclusion zone. And he was so close to the levee that it impacted this parking lot that the contractor couldn't complete the work until they they fledge. In this case, they uh, they weren't fledging fast enough. <laughs> And I'm sure the contractor and everyone else, maybe even you know, members from the city, that's not attribution. You know, maybe they went and tried to feed them <laughs> to, to hurry up the process. But they, uh, anyway, this was a good collaboration effort where they brought in environmentalists and everyone saw how what could we do to work around it, turn off uh, equipment backup noises and etc. And tried to deal with the situation that was there to do some level of effort until the bird fledged, the birds fledged and uh, moved on, and then we could finish up that project. Is it finished? This section is finished. And the Cowboys, they came last year. So if the Cowboys didn't come, you could have pointed your finger over by us and everyone else and said, well, what happened? But they came last summer, so this section actually got completed. This is the, the new section that we're going to work on. And this is a little further on uh, Ventura Road, up up around the turn. So we, the first part of the project I described, we finished right at the end of the open property as it approaches the road on uh, Ventura, Ventura uh, Road. So down at this end, it was completed. So right now you can see some eucalyptus trees that are right along the road. Uh, those are going to come down. Uh, flood wall is going to be placed uh, along right along the road. It's shown not landscaped, but we're expected to have some sort of landscaping there. And then uh, the flood protection is actually going to change sides. So the flood wall uh, <coughs> kind of stops right in this little gray area on the, on the bottom here. The flood wall is going to end right here. And this uh, is called the flood gate. It's going to be embedded into the road. Is going to pop up if if necessary, uh, based on the natural flow. So, oops. Is that wagon wheel going there? So what? Here's the here's the railroad. This is Ventura, but here's the the railroad crossing, and just beyond the railroad crossing is wagon wheel. Right. So we're looking towards River Park. Right? So the towards the collection. So this is the river side. Uh, this gate will be in place, and then the flood wall will be on the residential side and tie into a wagon wheel beyond the uh, railroad bridge. That's a gate that will pop up? Well, I say pop. I'm going to show you a video of how it actually operates. But the, uh, the theory is water, <coughs> high flow water, will come up and then come down the road and starts filling in into the reservoir for the gate and the gate hydrostatically lifts up and provides a flood wall system and, and makes the whole levee system contiguous. For my engineering friends, this is the diagram. <laughs> well, you're probably not interested in that. You probably want to get to the video. So, water flow, and it goes in, 
and starts to rot, starts to, this, basically it floats up, it's going to float. So back to your maritime, so wait, the maritime so this, piece. This is the, the road that walks up, is that what you're saying? No, so the, the gate, this gate is actually laying in the road. Okay. And when water comes, it's going to hydrostatically start to float and rise up. If we have a six and a half feet, is that what that six and a half means? Uh, this is three feet. Three feet. So if you're driving, you can actually jump in? Well, the city of Oxnard is going to do the traffic control, <laughs> and this is this is not a situation where it's going to happen immediately. It's not like your your smoke alarm in your house. It's, a, it's not going to go off like that. It's going to we're going to see information on the plot, I mean the, the the stream gauge plot. One of its action levels will be, hey, if we start seeing this threshold of flow, we need to call Oxnard PD, uh, city of Oxnard have them come down and, and we need to monitor when it's time to close off Ventura Road and uh, stop the traffic and then prepare for the water to come onto the road and raise the gate. <laughs> it, it will flow around, away from the homes. Yeah. The homes will be protected. <coughs> So this technology was proven out in uh, in Texas and more importantly last year in Houston. And this is a medical facility that, re that received uh, no water from the floods that were in Houston. And I'll show you how. Oh, was that the current? That was the So that's basically how it works. It'll be bigger and obviously a lot longer, but uh, that's that's the system. Yet? No, we're looking to start it later this year. How long will it take to complete? Probably about a year. So we have the. Well, the cowboys will be. They'll be protected by this whole system. So <laughs> they, they they can come anytime. They can come in winter or. You know. Is it still Romo? <laughs> they can come in a year. If they lose early in December, they could come before the Pro Bowl and get started. Yeah. They'll make it to the playoffs. But that's that's uh, that's the uh, the application, not exactly the way it's going to look and, and uh, the size of it. But that's uh, that's what we are anticipating uh, in the system. Never mind. I was just thinking, it's easy. What if the birds come back? Do you have to take a delay? <laughs> no. Unless the bird actually, there is a bird, is it the least turn? One of the birds, uh, Bells Bells, actually that slide was a Bells Bury. The least turn, so I, I had a tour, I had a tour in Coronado and the least turn was down there and Snowy Plover. Those guys, they just built, they just plop down in the sand. There's no tree, there's no bush. I mean, really, you wonder why you're near extinct? I mean, in this case, they'd have to actually be on the road to, to or be within that 500 foot exclusion area that we'd have to consider doing some level of effort. And, uh, <coughs> so here we are. Questions? I wanted to say, in your defense, uh, protecting, <laughs> protecting that bird, though, that is an FBI um, infraction. I actually cut a tree down where there was a nest and it was ravens or something. And after I cut the tree down, I was visited by two FBI officers. <laughs> it must have been a special so, situation for the FBI. <laughs> it's definitely a, a endangered species that's protected, yeah. right, by the endangered species. But that's the law enforcement that would come if you had, you know, kicked that little bird off the. It, it could. We, we actually have an enduring relationship with the environmental 
uh, regulators. So uh, we hope that the FBI would not come to our I don't side. have that relationship. So. <laughs> yes. So be careful. Yeah. What part do your rivers contribute to our drinking water? Um, some. So back to the groundwater component. About 60% 60, 60 of the drinking water comes from the groundwater basins in, in the populated areas. So as water comes, comes down, and in particular in the Santa Clara River system, there are basins in Fillmore Piru, there's a basin in Santa Paula, there's a basin uh, just around Ventura called the Mountain Basin, and there's the Fox Canyon Basin system. And so water, as it comes down the river, infiltrates and restores, recharges those basins. And United Water Conservation District kind of manages the diversions coming off of the Santa Clara River to, to recharge basins in the Oxnard Plain here. And uh, you know, that's, that's how it works. But there are basins up in the Simia Valley, down the Las Posas, Royal Las Posas. There's actually a high water table in Thousand Oaks. Very high water table, um, unusually high water table. We can't get water to infiltrate. We love to dump storm water into basins, and in particular near Thousand Oaks, but the water table is so high, there's nowhere for it to go. Uh, speaking about groundwater uh, spaces, in saltwater intrusion, and I know our current has got a, a groundwater replenishment site out of uh, I mean, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with, the, with Oxnard's particulars, but uh, within the, uh, the new law was passed in 2014, these uh, groundwater sustainability plans will, are set up to manage undesirable results. Right? And, and one of the key items is saltwater intrusion. So as these plans become, uh, in, through draft form, and in this case be adopted by the Fox Canyon Groundwater Management Agency, they will have uh, adopted a plan that deals with how they're going to control water in, in the basins and control any undesirable result that they're uh, trying to hold back from saltwater intrusion. So you could do that a number of ways. You could you could pump water in to hold it back. Uh, you could move agricultural pumping from the basin other places. So, so that the depletion isn't occurring, that may accelerate saltwater intrusion, the gradient difference. So there's lots of management strategies. If you're interested, uh, I suggest read up on the Fox Canyon uh, Groundwater Management Agency website, and they're going through and just developing, drafting their plans right now. They will, they will become much more public and be ready for adoption around the summer of 2019. They have to be submitted by January of 2020. So you're going to see a lot of activity, or hear, at least hear, um, you know, the literacy level of, of what's occurring here in, in the Oxnard Basin with respect to groundwater will become much more prevalent over the next uh, course of the next year. Does that get the I noticed on the board agenda yesterday there was an item for a feasibility study for the widening of Harbor Boulevard and replacement of the Santa Clara River Bridge on yes. Harbor. And I'm guessing that you guys would be intimately involved with getting that. I know I've been here 27 years and I've seen that water come up over the bridge. And the secondary part of that question is, is there any way that the breath is going to be rescued? Closed, they did some finagling and they were able to open a couple of campgrounds less later day, but it seems to be a lost cause unless we get to the The discussion with the board related to the bridge and the bridge widening was really their discussion. They're, they had some meaningful discussion about what that means. And so, as it relates to the Watershed Protection District, they uh, as it affects the bed and the bank, they would come and, and have some dialogue with it on how the bridge widening 
would affect the bed and the bank of the river in that particular location. With respect to the campground, I don't have any, I, don't, I can't uh, talk to that particular issue. I know it's open and closed at various times. Yes? The Santa Cruz Bridge was taken out in the 16th flood. So, uh, wouldn't that have to be raised or how to project? Yes. So as they come, as the transportation would come to Watershed Protection District to look at the effect of the bed and bank of the new bridge, we would do modeling and we would look at uh, hydrologic conditions that exist that would affect uh, the height and flows in that in that particular area. Just to consider that aspect, absolutely. You don't want to spend. Homeless camp there too. How is that going to incorporate into that? That that the main issue that. Right, sea level rise will, will be a component of the inputs that go in to figure out that. You know, I was having a, a dream of, well, just make it a gateway to, to uh, Ventura County. You have a big suspension bridge there, like uh, <laughs> Bully Gate Bridge, <laughs> way over. And then they don't have to come to Worship Protection District for a permit, because they'd be way far away from the bed and the bank of the river, and be really high up. <laughs> Anyway, it's a dream, right? It's just a visual aspect of that. <laughs> well, the cost of that and the maintenance of it, and, you know, they're, they're painting the Golden Gate Bridge every day. So <laughs> we don't want to put that in the backs of the taxpayer. Yeah. Yes. So how do these responsibilities um, cooperate and mesh with the, the um, wetlands rules and wetlands laws? Isn't this whole area considered a wetland, a natural wetland? So, so the wetlands, uh, wherever they are, um, they are always considered in every project that we we undertake. And uh, as it as it relates to both CEQA from a California environmental compliance component, and if there's any federal money, it complies with NEPA. And there's. Uh, so can you explain what those two things are? They're, they're environmental planning documents that look at all the alternatives as it relates to the, the, um, the proposed action. And there could be a preferred alternative, but there'll be other alternatives in these planning documents. And so your issue, would, the issue with wetlands would always get vetted in this uh, public process for the planning documents, uh, such that it's considered before a determination of a preferred alternative is decided upon. So right. they have so to do deal they with. Do all that due diligence? Because I haven't seen anything in the mail about it. For. For the, the public hearings and things about the wetlands, altering construction. Uh, for impacts. so they're they're project related. <clears throat> so the project I went through on the Santa Clara River, we right. we did environmental documentation for that. We're improving a levee system uh, north of uh, Highway 101 mm -hmm. up towards Santa Clara. And we're just now starting the process, the environmental planning process this fall, which will go through the, the rigor and the details of going through all all aspects with regard to. Uh, uh, and is that the Coastal Commission? Is that no, the yeah. Coastal Commission can can be involved as, as part of the process, but the guiding documents under the federal size is uh, the National Environmental Protection the Act, okay. NEPA, and then it's CEQA. California, if, it's just, if there's no federal money, it would be a sequel planning. But the processes are the same. And the processes are really uh, set up to allow uh, public engagement, full public engagement, but before the alternative is selected of what the agency wants to do. So on the sequel side, it would be an imp uh, environmental impact report, an EIR for a large project. And on NEPA, it's going to be an environmental impact statement, EIS. And those, those documents um, get well vetted, lots of public comment opportunity. Before. Are they online? You, they'll they'll be online. Yeah, most uh, large projects that have an EIR under California, EIS, will have online websites dedicated so that you can see uh, the iterative process of the planning as it goes along and allows for the comment period to occur so you can submit comments online. And they're, they're fairly long, it's not like they're going to jam a environmental planning level of effort like that in, right. in like three months and then go to construction the next one. These take a long time.
Yes. How long would it take to the lens to begin from 101 to Victoria How What's the time frame? Is that in each year a certain section? Or is it Sub a subject to funding? Subject to funding, we, and we get construction money. We can finish our part in uh, probably 18 months. We'll be done. Right? For the construction. Then there's the wagon wheel component that the developers are working on right now. And then you'll start the northern. The northern part uh, right now is estimated at 41 million to go from uh, the uh, the north side of 101 up towards uh, Satakoy, actually just past the Faro Basin. And so that's a significant project that will require uh, external money right now. We're looking for money for that. But that, that particular project is just starting the environmental process, so we haven't even figured out what we're going to build. So I encourage you also to look and get involved with that particular project if you're interested in that. Thank you so Thanks. much. Sure. Thank you. Much appreciated. Thank you very much, Michael. Thanks for having me.